Welcome to True Crime Review, an unflinching gaze into the depths of human depravity. The podcast covers current crime news, updates on cold cases and resources for research and investigation. True Crime Review often discusses disturbing and violent crimes, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the fourth episode of True Crime Review. Um, This one is a little bit later than I had hoped it would be, but I am glad to try out a new format, something that is the result of some listener feedback that I'm going to read uh, in a minute here. And um, and I just want to say sort of at the outset of this episode that I really, uh, I really appreciate feedback and, you know, anybody can tell me anything they want to tell me uh, about the show. This is the fourth episode. I hope to do this every week indefinitely. So... If it doesn't get better, um, you know, it's going to be a pretty, a pretty epic failure. So uh, please don't hesitate to, um, you know, send in, uh, whether it's through iTunes reviews or uh, sending an email to podcast at truecrimereview.net or finding us on uh, Twitter or Facebook. Um, you know, please send in all the uh, constructive criticism you can all I ask is is that it is constructive um, and uh, y- y- by this point it's going to be Monday when you get this episode out it'll be um, I guess it'll be September 19th which means that uh, the diehard true crime fans uh, 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 among us will have seen uh, the first episode of the new docu series about the Jean Benet Ramsey uh, murder case. So um, you know, that's something that I'll probably touch on after uh, after it's complete. But um, I just want to remind everybody: if you didn't already know, uh, the first episode of that docu series uh, did air on Sunday, September 18th, which assuming I do my job, it will be yesterday by the time this episode comes out. So now we're going to do a little bit of follow-up, which is how I think I'm going to start each show, um, just after the introductory sort of remarks. Um, and this is where I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some iTunes reviews that I thought were awesome. Um, the first one, it's going to be obvious why I think it's awesome. And the second one, maybe not be <laughs> so obvious. Um, but the first uh, iTunes review I want to read is by Cookie121955. And Cookie says, new, but you're off to an awesome start. And includes an exclamation point, which I take as a positive. Um, new is a statement of fact. Um, and off to an awesome start is really where I uh, get happy. And the five stars certainly doesn't hurt. And now I really love that review. And that is very motivating and very exciting and definitely the kind of thing that, um, you know, brightens up my day a little bit when I see it. Um, But I have to say that the second review I'm going to read to you is probably better um, for reasons that are obvious but a little depressing, um, but I think that it'll all make sense. So let me just read to you uh, this one-star review from JKL5876. JKL says, Needs improvement. I listened to all the true crime podcasts I find and was excited to see this new one. After listening to it, I was disappointed. The narrator talks in a monotone voice with no emotion. He tells only snippets of stories and does not make the stories of interest at all. It may help if you only do one case per show, have more detail about the victim, the trial, etc. Maybe if you had uh, two hosts on the show, you could discuss it 
and it sounds more interesting. Sorry for the low review. I'll try it again sometime to see if it improves. Best wishes. So, at initial glance, that review is, you know, that review splatters a sad face all over my computer screen, right? But um, the truth is that that is extremely valuable feedback. I, I mean, I'll go through it really quick. Monotone voice, absolutely monotone voice. I was, you know, recording in um, in my house uh, late at night, and I was sort of aware of the fact that uh, it was late and there were people sleeping elsewhere in the house. I have remedied that by getting uh, very far away from everybody that's sleeping, um, and there should be no. There's no really chance at all of anybody hearing me, no matter how loud I talk. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll do away with the, the monotone voice and give a little bit more sort of, in, you know, inflection and, and emotion. Um, the snippets of stories thing is, you know, more very legitimate uh, criticism. I'm still, again, still trying to feel out how this is going to work. I think that I starting to settle in on a format, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, but yeah, snippets of stories uh, are a problem. And I think it's probably, you know, there's probably a good reason we don't have a, a daily or a weekly true crime news kind of a show. And that's because it's, it's, it's not very easy to cover, you know, unfortunately, the massive amount of of crime that's going on and to keep any kind of sort of narrative thread running running through it, which is obviously what makes for the best uh, listening. I just want to add real quick um, a shout out and some thanks to the Curiosity Kills podcast, which you can find um, you can find their website at uh, Curiosity killspodcast.com and you you can find them on Twitter at C-U-R Kills Podcast um, I, I've gone back and forth a little bit with them on some recent uh, you know crime news stories and they have been especially uh, sort of supportive and um, and friendly and just uh, you know try to, to motivate me to push on through these first few uh, pretty messy episodes. Um, and so I just want to thank uh, those two. Um, that's a, a podcast that is hosted by um, a couple of women who do really an incredible job, uh, Lindsay and Haley, uh, with each case they cover. I think that there are 16 episodes in at this point. Um, and their most recent episode is uh, the first of a multi-parter on Lorenzo Gilliard. Who I've never even heard of, so I'm very much looking forward to listening to that. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks a lot to Lindsay and Haley for um, for the nice comments and to keep up the good work because you have a very loyal listener at True Crime Review. So thanks for that. So with that, um, I'm going to go into the news portion and talk a little bit about how that's going to change from the last episode. So, news is, uh, at, at least how I see it for now, is going to be just an update on one or two cases that are very prominent in the news, uh, or at least among true crime uh, folks. And, you know, it's going to be a lot more detail and a lot fewer cases. And again, the cases are going to be one or two uh, cases that we follow for a long time you follow them through uh, and where you know when one case sort of goes into a lull mode um, which happens again um, I'm an attorney and while I don't practice criminal law I know a lot of people that do and and I'm sure just from being interested in true crime many of you know you know a criminal case tends to hit a wall somewhere uh, at the beginning of trial and usually happens around uh, jury selection. Uh, so 
before jury selection, especially if it's a small town, there'll be a lot of back and forth among the attorneys uh, trying to get the judge to move it or delay it uh, or these things. So if that happens to a case that we're covering in this news section, we'll probably insert another case. Um, and I'll try and, I'll try and keep it easy to follow. Um, again, I'm still working it out. If it still doesn't make sense to you, let me know. Um, I'm all about incorporating as much feedback as, as, uh, you all are willing to give me. So please uh, don't hesitate on that. Now, the first case I'm going to follow up on is, um, it just seems to get worse and worse. And that's the, the murder, uh, the rape and murder of Victoria Martins, um, Victoria Martins, we talked about last time, she, uh, her mother set up um, some kind of a, I don't even know what to call it. She, her mother essentially set up the crime and uh, her mother's boyfriend and the female cousin of, the, of her mother's boyfriend came over. Um, the three of them uh, gave this little girl methamphetamine. I think she was 10 or 11. Um, I've got some of the some of the stuff right here. I've got some uh, primary source documents. I'm really big on those. I really like to try and provide as many of those as I can dig up. Um, so Victoria was 10. Um, she was shot up with methamphetamines, uh, and then she was sexually assaulted, uh, and then she was um, she was murdered. She was stabbed and then strangled, um, and police found her her body in the bathtub with, um, she was like wrapped up in a burning rug. And um, both of her arms were were gone. Um, so, so, I mean, this is just, I mean, this is just like the worst of the worst, right? It just does, it doesn't get worse. You, you would think, um, you know, unfortunately the reality is that it does get much worse. Um, the criminal complaint that CNN uh, obtained, and then I'm going to have in the show notes uh, and on the website of truecrimereview.net for you guys to um, read if you want to read it in its entirety. Um, the criminal complaint says that uh, a woman by the last name of Kelly, Jessica Kelly, who is um, Victoria's mother's boyfriend's cousin, um, she held her hand over Victoria's mouth as Gonzalez, quote, committed the sexual act while Martins watched. And according to the criminal complaint, um, quote, Michelle, who is the mother, Michelle stated she watched this happen for sexual gratification, unquote. Um, so now what we're finding out is that this woman, um, you, you know, aside from the fact that she had done this before, several times before, um, using the dating site Plenty of Fish, to find men who were interested in sexually assaulting her daughter and, and set that up for them. Um, it turns out at least, uh, at least once in the incident described in the criminal complaint that ultimately led to the murder of Victoria, she watched this abuse happen for sexual gratification. I mean, this is, this is a, a truly, you know, you know, when I, when you talk about the depths of human depravity is kind of our, our slogan or our, you know, catchphrase or whatever you want to call it at True Crime Review. And, you know, it does sort of catch the eye. Um, but the truth is, it's not really there to catch the eye. It's there because I, you know, I've been reading this stuff and, and, and seeing this stuff for so long that it's, you know, I mean, that's exactly what it is. I mean, it is the depths of human depravity and this, this monster, this piece of human garbage, as I like to say, um, uh, Michelle Martins is, you know, a prime example, uh, really the prime example of just, you know, what kind of depravity humanity is capable of. Um, apparently, uh, they have all been arraigned and they have, I think, all pled guilty by now. Um, and I just want to quote a spokesman for the police department that dealt with this case said uh, that the uh, complaint is one of the worst things that he has read in his entire life. Um, 
so again, that's up. Uh, that'll be on the site. You'll be able to read that. It's 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 really awful. Um, what this woman did and the way this this girl died. Um, and, you know, they said somewhere in the complaint that they gave her meth to calm her down prior to the act. Um, but what I know about meth is that it's not it's not the kind of thing that you take to calm down. Um, I think that meth is the kind of thing that really amps people up. And, you know, this, this little girl's final hours just had to be hell. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of situation where you really want to see these people suffer. And I don't know if the death penalty is really uh, what's going to make them suffer. You know, um, I don't know. The reality is that they, you know, they'll probably, um, you know, live for decades while they deal with appeals. Um, and if they have a successful insanity defense, which monsters, you know, like these people may very well be able to do, particularly the mother. Um, I can't imagine it's going to be that difficult to convince a judge to, to let the defense put um, uh, a psychologist or a psychiatrist on the stand to talk about, you know, just what kind of mental illness um, they were able to diagnose this um, defendant, Michelle Martins, with. Um, so, you know, I guess we'll have to wait and see, but that is a story that I'm definitely keeping an eye on because it's just, um, it, it's just awful. Uh, during um, the other woman's court appearance, Jessica Kelly, uh, the judge said, quote, the crimes display a depth of depravity that is unfathomable to me. So again, you know, it's just a catchphrase on our website and in our in our iTunes listing, but, but this, you know, it's there for a reason. And it's because there really is just, you know, unspeakable depths of depravity that humans are, are unfortunately able to engage in against each other. Um, it's a very sad, very sad case. Um, that's Victoria Martins. Um, and she had a very, there was a very big birthday celebration for her uh, uh, earlier, well, I guess last week at this point. Um, and and um, people are celebrating her life still, which is great. There's also a video that uh, a local news organization uh, came into possession of that is just a video of her playing at the uh, local pool. And, you know, so that'll be a link to that. will be in the show notes, too. And it's just to get a sense of the, this this girl, you know, you know, she was a person and she had good times. And, you know, it might be, you know, it helped me to see the video. You know, just because I think that it's, I don't think that it's fair that Victoria Martins only be remembered as, as the victim of a brutal murder. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember her as a kid, as somebody who had good times, and as somebody who uh, apparently touched the lives of a lot of people. And uh, people came out to celebrate her birthday um, and to show, um, you know, to mourn for her. And so that's just just a little bit of light in that tragedy. Now the next case we are going to turn to um, for a news update is the uh, Jessica Runyon's disappearance, um, which uh, authorities have connected to the disappearance of Kara Kapetsky from the same area seven years ago. Um, the primary suspect here is Kyler Eust. I mean, Kyler is a stupid name, um, but that's the least of, of our worries here. It's quite, it's quite apparent that this guy is a monster, and whether or not um, these charges stick, uh, it sounds like they probably will. Um, what we have in this case is a guy who was last seen with two women who disappeared without a trace from the same area. Um, he has a documented history of assault, a documented history of 
death threats, of threatening um, girlfriends, threatening their families, of uh, physically assaulting them. Um, he strangled one girl until she threw up all over herself. Um, he told one girl that he would kill her and her family. And he told, I, I don't know if these are the same girl or not, but he's also said that, um, that he's killed people for jealousy and that he's got connections to a pig farm where he could feed a body and it would never be found. Um, so, you know, this guy is clearly, um, you know, clearly capable of some pretty heinous um, assault and, and apparently follows through on threats like that. He was living on, he's been living on and off with his grandfather for a lot of his life. He was um, apparently arrested there, I think. Um, his grandfather has been talking to the news and has said that he won't bail him out, that he doesn't recognize the guy that's in the, the mug shots. Um, he doesn't recognize him at all. And so I have um, a police report from 2011, and it's from an assault incident uh, that occurred where Eust allegedly assaulted uh, an ex-girlfriend, and she luckily um, got away. She luckily uh, escaped his clutches. Um, but I just want to read you a small portion of this, and again, you know, this will also be uh, up on the website. Um, Okay, so I'm going to read to you some of this um, police report. It's just, it's just horrifying, and this guy is a disgusting piece of garbage. Um, so this was a report taken, I believe, on September second, twenty eleven. Um, so this is uh, some recollections by uh, an ex-girlfriend of his about something that happened on July 22nd or 23rd, 2011. Um, somewhere between midnight and 4 a.m. I'm going to read this as a quote. So, at some point between midnight and 4 a.m., used quote, came home to their residence uh, extremely intoxicated. And the victim stated they got into a verbal altercation regarding her wanting to end the relationship with used and he grabbed her by both hands, dragging her to their bedroom. The victim stated they used pinned her on the bed with his legs while she was laying flat on her back, motionless. She stated used used his legs to hold her arms down, where she could not move or get up. Uh, you know, this is already uh, assault. This is already um, false imprisonment. Uh, taking somebody from one room to another, and you know, for the purposes of falsely imprisoning them in some states, could be. Uh, it could even be a kidnapping charge. Um, so that, you know, this is already, um, this is already messed up. He pinned her legs while she was laying flat on her back, motionless, and, um, he looked into her eyes, grinding his teeth and licking his lips as he placed both hands around her neck. The victim started to scream, but you stated, quote, if you scream again, I will kill you faster than you can let out another scream out of your throat. It, I'm just going to read it one more time. If you scream again, I will kill you faster than you can let out another scream out of your throat. What a nightmare. I mean, what an absolute nightmare. The victim stated that he continued grabbing her around the neck using both hands and continued strangling her until she would almost lose consciousness. She stated that when she would almost lost consciousness, Yus would stop strangling her and turn around, intentionally punching her in the legs to stop her from losing consciousness. He did this several times. He did this over and over again to this woman until she finally lost consciousness when she regained consciousness, she could feel Eust laying behind her, spooning her, stating, and she stated to the, to the officer taking the report that he was lying directly behind her body to body and whispering, I love you in her ear. 
What a fucking creep. What a piece of shit. She also stated sometime during the incident, you pulled hair out from the back left side of her head. He grabbed the hair from her hands and burned the hair to destroy evidence. She then stated that Yus told her, quote, I will kill you and your family. The victim also told the officer that he, that you said he would kill her little sister if she ever went to the police about this incident. Um, you know, this is, you know, you know I talk about escalation. Right? Escalation usually starts with verbal abuse, uh, coercive control, and it usually progresses to cutting, cutting a victim off from their family and friends. And you know, then it progresses to establishing total control over their life. Um, usually, uh, paranoia is involved, uh, and then things like this, where you basically decide to do whatever you want to somebody, and you know, you threaten them and their family, their loved ones, um, with injury or death. You know, if you ever seek help, and it's it's that's exactly what it's meant to do: is to cut you off from any hope or thought that you might be able to get help. During the strangulation, I'm still reading from the police report. I'll, I'll stop in a minute, I promise. Um, it's just there's so much awful, um, awful stuff in this report. During the strangulation, you just made the following statement to the victim. During the incident, uh, the victim said that you told her, quote, I've killed people before, even ex garfans out of sheer jealousy. I will kill you. The victim stated she has never called the police regarding the incident. Remember, this report is taken in September. Uh, about uh, at least one of the incidents in the report is what had taken place in the previous July, so July 2011. Uh, she had never called the police regarding this incident because, quote, she is in fear of being killed. So this report goes on for um, a few more pages and involves at least one incident where a Kyler used kills a kitten, um, which of course is sort of true crime 101. Um, you know, you go from verbal uh, abuse to physical violence to, um, you know, uh, animal harm animal mutilation and soon after you got to the point where killing a human being is not a big deal to you and uh, you know from this report and from the other information available in uh, the news media it, it just seems like killing would not be an issue for this guy um, so this is a piece I'm you know I was trying not to make this explicit uh, I'm gonna have to add the tag because it's hard not to call this guy a piece of shit it's just hard I just I can't you know, you talk about um, talk about monotone. Um, the monotone is hopefully gone. Um, you know, this guy is it, you know is a piece of shit. He's a piece of garbage. Um, and whether or not he can be connected to these disappearances, um, it's safe to say that he, if he hasn't been involved in uh, the brutal assault and/or murder of one or more women that he he is well on his way to doing so and so it's just my sincere hope that they can find evidence sufficient to hold him on these charges and to get um to get something started uh that will keep him in prison and get you know and get us to a trial they did collect hair his hair and a lot of other evidence from his grandfather's trailer where he was living on and off and I think they collected a bunch of other evidence from another residence that he spent a lot of time at um, you know so obviously this is another story that I'm gonna follow very closely obviously Kara Kapetsky's um, family has been waiting seven years you know they they don't have a body um, they, they don't have a confirmation that she's alive or dead um, you know, all that they know is that she was last seen with this piece of garbage. And, and you know, now we have a girl named Jessica Runyon's 
who whose family is unf- is really sadly in a similar place. Um, it, you know, their daughter has not been found dead. There was actually um, a person, a deceased person, was found uh, either in that town or right outside that town along the highway, and there was some speculation at first that it was. Jessica Runyon's, but it has since been confirmed that it was not Jessica Runyon's. Um, so again, you know, so sort of crime 101 is, you know, with every passing day, it's less and less likely somebody is going to be found alive. Um, but it's something that we certainly can hope. Um, and certainly I don't know what else the family can do but hope. Um, I can't possibly imagine being in their position and, um, and you know, what can you say? You can't even wish them well, you know, in the coming weeks or months as this thing unfolds because, you know, the best case scenario is obviously getting their daughters back. And, you know, it just, it just doesn't seem like that's going to happen. There's just something in my gut that says that that's just not going to happen. And I hate saying that. But, um, Again, from what we know generally and from, from the way this guy's uh, profile is sort of um, filling out, and I'm not a profile, I'm not a psychologist, I don't, you know, I, I'm just I'm sitting here um, like everybody else trying to figure this stuff out and it just, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of hope here. Um, hopefully I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong. Um, I really would. So, you know, at this point, that's, that's just what I'm going to hope, is that uh, something good does come of this. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to move on to uh, another segment I'm going to try out. And again, feel free to, to come at me with feedback. Um, I don't know if we're going to call it legalese or jargon or some something... I don't know what we're going to do, so maybe if you have a good name for it, um, you can let me know. But it's going to basically be where I present just briefly um, a concept, a legal concept that comes up a lot in criminal law and in criminal investigations. Um, you know, as the introduction uh, to each episode says, you know, I want to provide resources for uh, research and investigation. Um, and we are going to do that. I'm going to do that more and more. So I'm going to try this one today. I'm just going to start with a very simple concept that has uh, a lot of ramifications in many, many cases and, you know, takes a lot of defendants, I think, by surprise in the worst way. And that is the felony murder rule. Now, you know, any of you that found this podcast, you probably found it searching for true crime. You probably know what the felony murder rule is. Um, but I just think it's important to start with some of the really uh, obvious stuff and sort of work our way into the more complex and and stranger stuff. So for anybody who doesn't know, the felony murder rule is this. Um, Any unlawful homicide committed during the commission of a felony can be attributed to any person involved in the commission of that felony. Okay, so what that means is, for example, um, if you and I uh, went to a bank to rob a bank and you are the getaway driver, right, and you are parked in an alley um, off to the side of the building and I go into the building and I go into the building and I show some teller my gun and I tell them that I want money or I'm going to kill somebody. Um, things get out of control, voices rise, things escalate, and I do end up shooting somebody and killing them. We are subsequently caught, as nearly all bank robbers are these days. Um, we are caught and we are put on trial, and you find out that you are being charged with murder, just like I am being charged with murder. And you may ask your attorney, what? Why am I being charged with murder? I was a getaway driver. I was sitting in a car. I was half a block away. And, you know, the fact is, like I just said, if a murder is committed during the commission of a felony that you were participating in, that murder can be attributed to you. Um, So we can both actually be charged with murder. Um, 
And there are instances where people ha have actually gotten worse sentences than their co-defendants because the co-defendant had certain information or a better lawyer or whatever um, and was able to sort of weasel their way into um, a life sentence or something like that. And somebody who had nothing to do with pulling the trigger ends up with a death penalty or something like that. Um, so the felony murder rule is very important. Um, it comes up a lot. It's very useful actually in leveraging the, um, I guess we'd say the non-trigger person, the non-trigger defendant. Um, you can get a lot of information out of a, a getaway driver, for example, who uh, you know is being told that they're going to be charged with murder because of the felony murder rule. Um, you, you know, you can get them to spill all the beans that they can possibly spill, um, just as you know, to get rid of that that murder charge. So um, that's the felony murder rule. And again, if you have any feedback on that, um, you know, please feel free. I'm going to go to the last segment, and we're going to have um, you'll see a couple more resources come up in that segment. But um, I want to definitely have something like that, whether it's a, you know, a legal concept or um, an investigative tool or an investigative method and stuff like that. Um, I definitely want to do something like that in each episode, so suggestions are always welcome. Okay, and we're going to end each episode with a discussion of a cold case, and I'm really going to try to focus on um, cold cases that are, you know, that don't come up in the news, that probably don't even come up on Reddit, you know, so uh, this is not going to be where I discuss Mara Murray, for example. Um, I'm sure, again, you found this podcast by searching for true crime, chances are you know who Mara Murray is. Um, and the fact is that there are a lot of cold cases that have, you know, that are cold in the sense that we don't have any new leads or don't have many new leads, but, um, but are not cold in the sense that they are still widely circulated and discussed and analyzed. Um, and in some cases investigated by multiple parties with, you know, multiple agendas. And, you know, there's a lot of drama, uh, that may unfold, you know, especially when I think of the Mara Murray case, um, as an example. So I'm going to try and stick to cases nobody really talks about, nobody really knows about. Um, and the first one today that really just came up kind of randomly um, is a, a, a man by the name of Christopher Allen Zoll. And Christopher Allen Zoll went missing in Holmdel, New Jersey in May of 1994. And this is a case that I found on defrostingcoldcases.com, which is a really wonderful website that basically makes it there their primary um, motivation is to do exactly this, is to bring um, is to bring fresh eyes to cold cases nobody talks about. Um, so I'm going to just, I'm going to read you some of the information um, that defrostingcoldcases.com compiled on Christopher Allen Zahn. He was last seen alive on May 12, 1994 in Holmdel, Monmouth County, New Jersey. He was 43 years old. He's a tall white man with brown hair and blue eyes. He has a scar on his right knee. His disappearance is suspect. And NamUs, which I'll explain in a minute, NamUs lists him as endangered, missing, foul play possible. Um, so this NamUs is, uh, is the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. And uh, the NamUs website can be uh, found at findthemissing.org, and they have just massive amounts of cases on that on findthemissing.org about missing persons. Um, and so a lot of this information that defrostingcoldcases.com has came from NamUs or came from the National Missing Persons Directory, which is located at missingin.org. Again, that's... Uh, missingin.org, the National Missing Persons Directory. 
So I'm going to read you a little bit about how um, uh, how Christopher's car was found. It was found the the day after the last day he was seen alive. So May 13th, 1994, at the Red Bank train station. Inside his car, police found his glasses and his wallet with credit cards, but there was no sign of Chris. What clothes he wore the day he went missing are unknown, but he carried a watch and a keychain. Uh, there's no uh, information available about those items. His dental records, DNA, and fingerprints have all been uploaded to NamUs. That's what makes NamUs so incredibly valuable. Um, you know, aside from uploading, obviously, you know, textual information and uploading photographs, you can upload dental records, DNA, fingerprints, all these things um, that uh, local and regional law enforcement can use that um, people like us can use when we want to dig into a cold case and see if we can help somebody um, find their loved ones. Uh, so his information is all in NamUs, and there is a strange note from the newsletter called The Noose, which is the newsletter of the Mystery Writers of America, New York chapter. Um, this is a very, very strange um, clipping that defrostingcoldcases.com found. Um, this comes uh, from the meeting notes of the July slash August 2007 New York chapter of the Mystery Writers of America. Quote, Two brothers feuding on over the family's tree farm. Chris Zoll was growing marijuana as well as trees and his brother tipped off the police. The brother wanted to buy out Chris, then Chris vanished. Police found his car at the Red Bank train station, wiped clean of fingerprints, to complicate matters, Chris had been having an affair with his best friend's wife. So uh, there's nothing uh, anywhere that uh, corroborates the claims made in this, uh, this uh, newsletter uh, portion. So it's very, very strange. Uh, definitely um, sort of unusual. I've never seen a mystery writer's um, newsletter at all, let alone one coming up in a cold case. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. That, that sounds like it's a good lead. Um, the person that, uh, that runs defrostingcoldcases.com uh, was unable to find anything else. Uh, sort of, you know, and the trail goes cold there. If you do have any information about Chris Saul or know anybody that might, please contact the Holmdell Police at 732-946-4400. That's 732-946-4400. And Christopher Zoll's case number, in case his name doesn't ring a bell, is 946-716. And that information will all be in the show notes. Um... It, you know, if that stuff with his brother is true, then it, you know, it's certainly possible that um, that his brother could be a suspect, right? I mean, I always go to if the wallet is found in the car, um, and there's credit cards, especially. Chances are it's not a robbery. Um, yeah, chances are it's not. Um, it's not a suicide. It's hard enough to hide a body when you murder someone. It's it's even harder to, to hide your body when you're committing suicide. And I don't mean that to be glib. I mean, you know, where would he have gone? Most people would have done it in the car. Um, uh, you know, if that's where their, their stuff was found. Or most people would have done it at home, or they would have done it, you know. Um, you don't just vanish if you're killing yourself and and people who mean to rob you don't just leave your wallet in um, in plain sight in your car. So, you know, this looks to me like it could be something involving his brother. If this blurb from the, the Mystery Writers newsletter is to be believed, and there's no reason that we think it should or shouldn't be believed. Um, 
is a lead and maybe, you know, maybe we can look into that uh, at some point ourselves. But that is Christopher Zell. So, um... So that is, that's it. That is sort of the, the really disorganized attempt to organize this episode a little bit more than the previous three um, into some kind of a recognizable and repeatable format. Um, again, I know I've been saying it over and over again in this episode, but I was so excited to get any feedback at all so early. Um, when I saw those two iTunes reviews, that um, I'm hoping that if I actually ask for it, then I'll get even more. And I do, I want the feedback. If you just want to tell me it's awesome and give me five stars, I'm not, I'm not going to stop you. Um, If you want to give me one star, like JLK did, um, that's fine too, but I want you to tell me why. You know, what can I do better? What did I do wrong? You know, is there too much monotone? Did I not say piece of shit enough? Because we're dealing with a lot of pieces of shit um, going through, you know, going through these cases. Um, Whatever it is, I really want feedback. I want it to be constructive. I don't care if it's negative, um, as long as it's constructive. So I just want to say. uh,